The biggest question I ask is, what's your 10-year business plan? Are you kind of towards the growth end of your business progress? Are you still in infancy stage? Like, it wouldn't have made sense for you to buy a 1,500-square-foot office building when you've got big growth plans. We've seen it, too, where a client will buy a building, and they think they're going to be there forever, and they land a huge account, and all of a sudden, they're like, well, man, I need more space. Welcome to In the Thick of It Toolbox, the special series where inspiration meets implementation. Here, we don't just share success stories, we equip you with proven tools and strategies from seasoned founders, turning entrepreneurial dreams into actionable plans. Prepare to be enabled and empowered on your journey. You're not just listening to a podcast, you're gaining access to an essential toolbox for your business success. Let's dive in. Today, we have a special episode featuring advice for business owners exploring their next commercial real estate opportunity. I'm joined by Adam Curran, Managing Principal at Holt Lunsford Commercial. With over 20 years experience in commercial real estate, Adam explains the different questions you should ask yourself when planning to lease or buy a commercial property, all while considering your business's 10-year plan. Whether you've leased a commercial property or not, this talk provides great perspective into the complex world of real estate. Plus, Adam discusses his personal journey and offers advice to anyone pursuing a career in commercial real estate. Today, I am beyond excited to have an extra special guest on our In the Thick of It Toolbox, my best friend since, what, 1997? Yeah. Adam Curran is joining us to talk about the world of commercial real estate and how real estate is such an important part of your business and as an owner, as a founder, kind of what you need to be thinking about when leasing or buying. So Adam, thank you so much for coming over today. Yeah. Very excited to be here and glad to see this whole thing come to fruition. You've been talking about this for a long time and excited to see you in action. Yeah. Well, let's do this. I know the backstory, but our listeners may not. How did you get into this world in the first place? Yeah. So I grew up in Austin with Scott here and all through high school, really middle school and high school, I thought I wanted to go into the vocational ministry. And so Growing up in Austin, I didn't have an option for kind of a religion or theology degree to study anywhere in Austin. So applied to three schools. Baylor was one of them. Baylor was my top choice and told my dad, hey, if I can get in by the skin of my teeth, that's where I want to go. And he said, if you get in, we'll figure out how to pay for it. And so I got in, spent my freshman and sophomore year as a religion major and was kind of on the path towards vocational ministry. And then at the end of my sophomore year, I did an internship with our pastor at the church I grew up in, which was a different pastor than I grew up with, but the same church. And he was discipling me that summer, and we spent every morning together and just kind of talking through theology and talking through life. I was single at the time, so probably 20 years old, just all things that are associated with discipling a young 20-year-old man. But he asked me about halfway through the summer, he said, hey, how do you know you're called to the ministry? And Man, as you know, I did not have a good answer at all. In fact, I was like, I don't know. (laughs) And so that kind of sent me into what I now call a vocational identity crisis. And and I'm like, well, if I'm not going to do ministry and I don't really know if I should do that, maybe I'll change my major. So I changed my major that that year, spent that next year as an aviation science major. I mean, at the end of my junior year in college, I did an internship selling books door to door. So I was cold calling knocking on doors in the dead of the summer and just trying to sell books to families that were looking to buy a study guide and very, very hard sales training. Probably the hardest cold calling you can do is knocking on doors, especially in neighborhoods in the middle of the summer with no kind of experience or no, you know, intel as to whether or not that family has kids or anything. You're just literally cold calling. So fast forward to the end of my junior year, I was way behind in my coursework for that aviation degree. And so I switched it back to religion just to graduate on time. And then at the end of my fifth year in college, I started really thinking about what do I want to do. And I was in a fraternity and it seemed like everybody's dad of all my fraternity brothers were everybody was in real estate. So there was no shortage of people to pick up the phone and call and try to set meetings with. The president of our fraternity, he had was working in what's called office tenant representation work. And I had no idea what that was. And he was like, yeah, we essentially help office tenants find space to lease and we help them negotiate their lease. And then he kind of outlined candidly how the commissions were paid. And I was like, man, that sounds, (laughs) 
that sounds pretty appealing. And so I interviewed probably 20 or 30 different spots. I was dating my now wife. She was, of course, hired in the second interview that she ever had because she's that great. But she got a job in Dallas. So I was looking in Austin, Dallas. Had another fraternity brother introduce me to a guy who does industrial tenant rep and is still in the business and tenant representation work. And my buddy said, hey, if this guy gives you a shot, you got to take it. And interviewed with him. It was a very casual deal, but he gave me an offer. And and that is really how I, how I got into the business. I wouldn't say that I had a bunch of like analytical kind of calculus, how to get into the, the real estate business, but it was really just for me looking to how could I leverage the sales experience I did have that summer. And then I just kind of thought candidly, if you're going to cold call and deal with a ton of rejection, you know, what's something that has a decent payoff to it. And that just seemed like where all the doors were open. And i stepped through that first door and been in the business ever since coming up on 20 years. So it's hard to believe. Yeah, man, there were parts of your story that I'd, I'd actually hadn't thought about in a long time. You talked about selling books. You were with Southwestern. Yeah. And I want to talk about that for just a second. Well, yeah. I mean, elaborate a little bit more because like, it's kind of crazy what they do. Yeah. Like you show up at this convention, it's rah, rah, rah. Yeah. And they then tell you where in the country you're expected to go and who right. you're going with. Yeah. Like, walk us through that for a minute. Yeah, it's crazy. So this company has been around for 150 years. They used to sell, really for about 120 years, they sold Bibles door to door, which is a little bit easier to sell, I think. If you find someone who's a, a believer, they'll probably buy one out of sympathy just to help you out. But probably 30 or 40 years ago, they started selling these study guides door to door, but they recruit really heavily on college campuses. And they recruit a lot at Baylor, recruit a lot at A&M. And I had another fraternity brother who had gone through the program the year before and just done exceptionally well. And I think he'd made like $13,000 that summer. And I remember thinking, I could probably work 10 summers and not make that amount of money. And so it was intense training. I mean, you, you meet with your sales sponsor, who was this fraternity brother of mine, and we met once a week before even leaving for the summer. And then the summer hits and you leave for a week, you go to Nashville and you do a sales school for that summer. And it's like 90% rah-rah, like, hey, here's the mental training. There's not a whole lot of technicality behind, here's how you handle objections, or here's how you close the order. Here's how you collect payment. There was a little bit of that, but it was it was a lot of mental toughness training. And uh, not like Navy SEAL mental toughness, but you know, but sales, mental sales training, toughness. And that's required there because the dropout rate is 70%, yeah. 80%, yeah. maybe higher. Yeah. A lot of people don't make it. Yeah. And you may not remember this, but I actually didn't make it. Well, so. <laughs> you had some unique circumstances there, but. I did. Yeah. But yeah, I lasted for about four weeks and learned a ton that I still use to this day. One of the big things that they would say over and over and over again is there's so much you can't control. You can't control, really, you can't control if someone's going to buy from you. You can't control what you're going to see on the other side of that door. You can't control how they're going to react. But you can control how many doors you knock on, and you can control your attitude. You can control what time you start work, what time you end work. You can control how you react to certain situations. You're in control of those things. And so a big part of their training was, I mean, just simply stated, control the controllables. And I still use that to this day, try to, in commercial real estate, try to take the emotion out of the transaction. Cause you would think that the commercial side of business is, is less emotional than the residential side and it can be, but it's still, you know, in most cases you have a tenant, a landlord who'd never meet face to face. They never talk on the phone, really. They're dealing with their brokers and the brokers are trying to appease the situation sometimes and having to kind of broker a peace treaty between a tenant and landlord, even before the deal starts can sometimes come up, but you know, if I can control what I can control, that makes me, I think, a lot better advisor to my clients because, you know, there's just all kinds of emotional ups and downs in a commercial real estate transaction. But that was a big part of it. And then just, you know, being with a team was huge too. I mean, you go out to your territory by yourself, but at the end of the day, you come back to a house and this is wild too, but the way you find a place to live is you knock on doors. I cannot wrap my mind around, okay, I'm in Nashville, I get an envelope and it says you're going to Toledo, Idaho mm -hmm. and, or Ohio. Yeah, Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, there we go. It's probably Toledo, Idaho. 
somewhere. Pro- probably. <laughs> I mean, there's a Paris, Texas. That's true. But yeah, I've never been there before. I don't know a yeah. soul. Yeah. I have no money except for whatever I came with. And they're literally just like feeding you to the wolves. Yeah. Like, so no money, find a place to live, live on like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, three meals a day yeah. and knock on doors and just get rejected after, you know, time and time and time again. Yeah. And that was how you found a place to live. I mean, so they, like you said, they don't have, they weren't doing a bunch of demographic studies on where they're going to send you. They literally pulled out a map. And in those days, it might've been a Mapsco or a giant road atlas. And they're literally circling zip codes and they have zero income data, zero demographic data on any of these territories. And they're just like, you're going here, Adam, Scott, you're going here. Jake, you're going here. And so you pull up and you have no idea if most of these families can afford these houses or afford these, uh, these study guides you're trying to sell. But in order to kind of get you to overcome that, the way they want you to find a place to live is knocking on doors. And so it was a little passive aggressive. I mean, you knock on a door and you'd be like, hey, I'm a college student from Baylor. I'm here working this summer I'm with some buddies of mine and we're looking for a cheap place to rent. So you're asking for them to give you a lead essentially, but you're Fingers crossed. You're, you're angling. Hoping, <laughs> you're hoping they're like, oh, I've got a back house for rent for $300 a month. But man, we knocked, my team of four, we knocked on doors all day, every day for a week. And at the end of the week, we didn't find a place to live. And that was extremely demoralizing because other the teams had found awesome back houses to rent. And, and I called my sales manager. I'm like, what do we do? He's like, well, why don't you rent a hotel for a week? And then we'll figure it out. So we just started selling books and rented a hotel. And man, thank God that summer, someone had called the school, the sales school from that territory. And she was like a yoga instructor or something and had a room that she had rented to salespeople the year before. And she was like, oh, I just love the energy of having young college students in the house for that summer and could use the income. If they're students that need to rent a place, then we'll do it. So... (laughs) Myself and my three other teammates, we slept on, there was a queen bed and then there was room on the floor. So we would rotate who slept on, (laughs) who slept in the bed and who slept on the floor. So if probably if you had the worst day of selling, you got to sleep in the bed, but just a wild experience. But that set you up for, if you're willing to knock on, if the philosophy was, if you're willing to knock on a door to try and find a place to live, which is a lot more of a direct ask than trying to sell a book, then you can for sure knock on a door to try and sell a book. But like I said, crazy sales experience, but the mental training for controlling the controllables, controlling how many people you can talk to, controlling your attitude throughout the process has really served me incredibly well. And actually this is cool too, but the owner of the company that I first went to work for when I was interviewing, even though I had it in with uh, one of the principals there, the guy who founded the company had sold Bibles with the Southwestern company in the 1940s or something. And so, wow, it was a cool you had that connection. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so many valuable lessons there, obviously that have served you well in your real estate career, but man, that idea, if you take one thing from listening to this episode, the idea that control the controllables, like that's huge. And that can be applied to anything, mm-hmm. whether it's sports, whether it's school, whether it's business, yep. control the controllables. As an aside for owners and founders who are listening, and if you are ever hiring for a sales position and you find somebody that has Southwestern on their resume, if you find somebody that's crazy enough to have done that, mm-hmm. you need to give that person a shot because they're everyone I've ever known that has done it. Yeah. They have had phenomenal, phenomenal sales careers. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I only lasted about four weeks doing it, but, but yeah, those four weeks were, were training enough to, to last me a lifetime. But yeah, if you're looking to hire sales folks and you see that on the resume and that's the only thing you see on the resume, it's probably going to be pretty good, pretty good shot. They're going to be successful. It's worth the interview for sure. Yep. For sure. All right. So today you are with Holt Lunsford, very reputable real estate firm here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. How did you come to Holt? Yeah. So really last year I, I was working for a fortune 1000 commercial real estate firm. I I spent the first five years at that firm that initially hired me out of college. And then at the end of that five years, I was recruited to go work for another kind of smaller boutique firm here in town. And part of the recruitment pitch from that owner 
was, hey, why don't you come over and help me kind of hire and train brokers? And that's a piece of the business that I really, really enjoy. Just like going out to your territory and selling books, like brokers on their own can be a very individualistic sport. And at the end of the year, it's kind of like you and your 1099 high-fiving each other and saying, hey, man, we had a good year. We didn't. You know, it's you and this piece of paper. And the year starts over every year. So it can be a very kind of lonely individual sport, even though you're working deals with clients and you're working deals with other brokers and lawyers and contractors. There's a ton of interaction. The production at the end of the day falls on you. But what I really enjoyed at, at my first job was we had an intern that would come in every summer and I really enjoyed kind of training him and kind of mentoring and discipling him in the business. And and so when I got hired by my second firm, he kind of hired me to kind of expand that desire and that role. And so that that worked well for a while. And then I decided I, I needed to kind of be with a bigger firm after a while. I think what happens at the smaller firms is even if you're a good salesperson, it's just harder to break the kind of corporate veil or the the veil of the bigger square footage if you're trying to chase bigger business. And so I went to a Fortune 1000 company and then I hired a teammate about two years ago. We were kind of having the same kind of success that I was having 10 or 15 years ago. I was really enjoying training him. And about six months ago, I started thinking, man, you know, what if I didn't just have one of these young teammates? What if I had a, a team? What if I had eight to 10 of them? And so I was kind of looking around at the firm I was at, at the time and I was like, I know they would support me to do it, but there's a lot of brokers here. I wouldn't have the autonomy probably to, to run that team the way I would want to run it. And so I was candidly thinking about starting my own company to do that and was pretty far down the road. And the thought process was kind of studying on the side to get the broker license. You got to have that. And so was working through that. And then I got a call from a guy I know at Holt Lunsford Commercial. And he was essentially like, hey, we'd love for you to come over and do exactly what, he had no clue I was thinking about maybe starting my own company. So it was, it was a total godsend. But he was like, hey, we want to talk to you about running our industrial tenant rep division. And I was like, man, I'm all ears. It, it, Holt Lunsford himself is a 30-year business owner. He's a former Trammell Crow guy. He's very involved in development and brokerage and leasing and management. They have an office in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston, a huge landlord presence, so close to 100 million square feet of leasing and management assignments just in those three cities, of which about 90% is industrial. So it's a they're an industrial juggernaut, but most of their business is on the landlord side and leasing buildings and managing buildings. And they didn't have anybody that was overseeing kind of their industrial tenant representation division. They had two brokers on the team that were young and hungry and knocking on doors. And, and they were like, we want, we just want somebody to come in that has some experience and desire to train and help these guys succeed. And we think that they're, they have what it takes to be successful, but we want someone to come to come in and kind of put some framework to the team and build it out. And what he described was number one, exactly what I was thinking about doing on my own. And number two, my dream role. I mean, it was really the side of the business that I've enjoyed a lot is that training and discipleship, mentorship piece. And and so we worked out details pretty quick. And so I started there in December of last year. So still, it's kind of a relatively new role, but one that I'm super excited to take on. So Yeah. Well, you've worked for a lot of different firms, but you've done similar work across them. And something you touched on a couple of times, and I, I kind of want to drill down from there. You mentioned something that's really important, that you're in the industrial real estate space. Mm -hmm. And just like doctors have specialties, right? Real estate's a, a pretty specialized thing too, right? Yep. And you're not prohibited from leasing or working other types of space, but you have chosen to focus on the industrial side of things. Maybe kind of talk about what the different niches or types of property there are, and maybe just kind of distinguish a little bit for people who may not really understand. Sure. Yeah. So there's various asset classes within commercial real estate. You know, commercial real estate is a broad umbrella term for anything that is not residential, but even multifamily itself, which is apartment complexes that would technically fall underneath the commercial umbrella. But you've got multifamily, which is apartment complexes, single family rentals, You've got retail, which is anything from mom and pop 
kind of small strip shops to large malls like North Park or the Galleria. And then you have office space, which is anything from like the building we're sitting in here to high rise downtown, you know, million square foot office buildings that are 50, 60 stories high. I really wanted people to think that we were in that big 50 million. You're in half a million feet. Yeah. Yeah. Spire. We'll go with that. We'll get Vin there eventually. And then you have industrial, which is the sector that I'm in, which is essentially bulk distribution warehouses or manufacturing facilities. Nothing fancy about them, but even between of the close to a billion square feet of industrial product that exists in the Metroplex, there's no two buildings that are identical, even though they're all going to have similar features. But it's essentially trucking facilities that are shipping and receiving product. They're warehousers, third-party logistics providers. I've got clients that are printing companies, so the large printing equipment, they do large format printing. Other clients that are electrical contractors that do a little bit of distribution and and they have an office component up in front of the warehouse. But that's essentially industrial. Anything that has a dock door is typically industrial. I mean, you got to be a little careful because retail has, you know, dock door on the back. But if an 18-wheeler can pull up to it and pull product out, rack it in the warehouse and then put it in another 18-wheeler to go to a customer somewhere, then that's probably an industrial building that we're looking to do business in. So Yeah. And I mean, is it fair to say that when you're going down a path that it really is important to work with somebody that like that is their focus, that is their specialty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is part of my pitch as to why you should hire us. One of the things I start with that in the state of Texas, you get a real estate license and there's one real estate license for every single transaction you can possibly imagine. So in theory, I could represent you buying an office building. I could help you find a house to buy. I could help you find a house to rent. I could help you find an office building to buy. I could help you with a lot of different things, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be great at any one of those things. So, you know, what I say in a lot of our presentations is that it's pretty easy to get the real estate license, which buys you the right to represent somebody, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be the best person to do the job. And so I've always tried to, and this is something I learned from Southwestern Company, they were very geographic specific. They literally drew street lines on the map and they were like, hey, Adam, this is your territory. Don't go inside this box. And so that's how I grew up in the business where they train you to be an expert in a submarket, and then be an expert in a product type. And then I've tried to really become an expert in lease transactions in a specific product type as well. So, you know, a lot of what I say too, is that a lot of brokers just want to get you in the car and they want to tour you as fast as possible. But we've got what I consider to be likely one of the most thorough processes in the business. And it's really just accumulation of the 20 plus years experience that I've had negotiating deals. But, you know, you've got to know a little bit about everything. And because of that, you really want to specialize in a sector if you're looking to get in the business. And if you're looking to hire a broker to do your deal, you want to hire somebody who's got a pretty significant track record. In fact, I've got, you know, a list of questions that you should be asking your real estate broker in an interview. You know, I think the best thing to do is interview two or three, kind of take the relationships off the table and say, here's what I'm looking for in a broker. How would you handle my transaction? And have them tell you, number one, why they're the best fit. And number two, what they would do for you. Because I think you get a lot of people that will read a resume and they're like, look at all these deals I've done, but they don't really know how to explain how they're going to run the transaction for you. So we try to do both. I mean, there's Obviously, I've not seen everybody's pitch, but I think that we've got a very thorough process that benefits the client at the end of the day. So yeah, that's what we try to focus on. Is it common for people to represent themselves in a commercial transaction? I would say no. In fact, this is part of our presentation as well, is that, you know, if you go up against a landlord, most of the buildings in Dallas now are owned by institutions. And so those institutions are going to have an attorney on retainer. They're going to have a construction management team. They have a local asset manager. They got a property manager. They have a real estate broker. They have a giant team of people telling them how to make the best deal on their side of the transaction. And so you take one guy who does a real estate deal, maybe if he's lucky every three or five years, most lease terms, depending on a variety of different factors or five, seven, sometimes 10 years. So you take a guy who is doing a deal only three to five years max, they're just not going to be an expert in it. And I I like to tell prospective clients too, like, I feel like I'm a pretty good negotiator. 
but I've only bought three cars in my life and I only buy them like once every six or seven years. And I always walk in thinking I'm a pretty good negotiator, but I've never once walked out and thought, man, I got the better end of that deal. You know, <laughs> I have one time. I've never, maybe I'll have you do my next car negotiation. <laughs> Yeah. I must have slept at a holiday in the express that night before that that last yeah. negotiation. But you got very lucky. So what I tell my clients is, hey, or prospective clients even, hey, we do this all day every day. So you can go get data on the internet and you can try to negotiate against the landlord, but then there's all kinds of other things that come up. And it's not just like buying a house where you just negotiate the price. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of issues that can come up during the lease negotiation process that if you're not careful, if you're only focused on the lease rate, you can really get hosed and you end up in this lease that becomes legally enforceable and you're stuck with it for five to 10 years. So you're way better off using a broker to help you negotiate all of the ins and outs of the transaction. Just jumping in on that for a second, you've represented on a couple of transactions and there are things that like, I don't even know that they're a thing. And you're coming to me and you're like, well, hey, I think we should approach him like this. And here's how the offer should be structured and da, 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 da. And oh my gosh, if I had tried to do things on my own, yeah. I would have totally hosed myself. I can think on one of the first ones, I was a little bit concerned about, you know, we we're growing really fast and I just don't know if this is going to be big enough for us. And probably it was only like a three-year lease, maybe, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe it was five. But you said, okay, no, here's how we'll handle this. We'll put in a clause that it this point in the contract, you have the option to buy out early. It will cost you, but it won't cost you as much as if you ride the whole lease all the way through. Yeah. And we actually ended up doing that. Mm -hmm. And from a timing standpoint, it was right as COVID was happening that we got to move out. And so in a lot of ways that that timing worked out real well. And then in the most recent transaction, man, you worked some magic in, there was a tenant in the building and we wanted in as quick as possible, but we didn't have to tell them that. And they actually had to pay us for a year that we were in the building and we basically covered our cost for the first year. So yeah. like, these are things I would have never even considered if I was trying to represent myself in this. Right. Yeah. And that's stuff you just accumulate from the school of hard knocks. You know, <laughs> I've got a uh, trainer guys on a lease audit system that I use that I've kind of developed over time that when I first started it, it was only like 20 or 30 points, but now it's up to like 65 points on this checklist that I use. And the reason is because you just accumulate knowledge over time and you just learn things that like, Hey, if we ask for this, but we also give them this, if we give and take a little bit, if we find some things that are like, Hey, these are non-negotiables, but what could we give the landlord to kind of entice them to negotiate on that term? I believe in, you know, it's got to be the right deal for everybody, but everybody has an incentive and everybody's like, Hey, if you can help me get out of the building early, maybe I'll pay you, maybe I'll pay you for an option that you wouldn't otherwise ask for if you weren't working with a broker. But I think that comes down to really just finding a broker that you think is going to run a thorough process. And, you know, we're commission only. So that's one thing to be aware of. There's a tendency in our business just to, we have brokers, we hear it all the time. They just want to quote, slam the deal home, just get the deal done as fast as possible. But I want clients for life and I want clients that are going to come to me for 20, 30 years of transactions that are like, Adam, you're my guy, no matter what. Of course, I can still screw it up, but I don't want to take the short-term approach. I want to take the long-term approach. And I want you to feel comfortable that you're in a lease that or a building that you bought that we ran the due diligence on together. That you're like, hey, I, I knew all the good, the bad, and the ugly before I bought it or leased it. And I made a business decision to move in or to walk away. And hopefully there's no, I mean, we can't find everything, but hopefully... 90% of the surprises that would normally pop up are taken care of. So that's a big deal. And I also think like if I were a small business owner, how would I want to be treated? And this is one thing that Holt Lunsford himself is really great at is one of the core values of our company is the, the do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Like how would you want for a broker with 20 years experience to advise you on a transaction that you do once every three to five years? You know, if you were in that seat and I was in the other seat, how would Adam Curran want to be advised on the transaction, not knowing what I don't know? So that's kind of my core philosophy. And I try to try to not be so thorough that we're never going to get a deal done because I think some brokers can treat the deals like attorneys. No offense to the attorneys out there, but 
we don't get paid until the deal closes. So there is an incentive on our end too, to help try to find some common ground and, and negotiate a deal. But I've also told clients, Hey, they're not going to budge on this. And I think it's a deal killer. And that's a four letter word in our business. A good negotiator never wants to use the term deal killer, but sometimes you have to, to get the point across that that's that important to the client. So, and then if they don't, you know, if the landlord or seller doesn't agree to it, then you move on. And if, uh, you know, you likely can find somebody to give you what you're looking for. So you've, I think, touched a little bit on some of the specifics, but maybe if we could unpack it a little bit more, like you talk about the process mm-hmm. or maybe even ask differently, like what does a process look like? So if I'm an owner and I'm looking to get my first space, like what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. So I think a lot of tenants and even first time building owners, they have kind of a perception of what the deal is going to look like. And one thing that's super shocking to first time tenants is the uh, triple net lease structure, which essentially a triple net lease structure is that the landlord's going to take care of three components of the building, the the roof, the walls, and the foundation. And then you're going to reimburse the landlord for the property taxes, the real estate insurance, and then common area maintenance. And that's all done on a per square foot basis. And but what most tenants are shocked to find out if they didn't use a broker or they didn't use one that explained something to them is how much they are physically responsible for maintaining and set the space. You know, an air conditioning unit breaks in July, they call their property manager like, hey, air conditioner broke. And the property manager's like, well, sorry, your lease says it's your responsibility. So that's always not a fun call. And so we try to negotiate that. But I think for first time tenants, just be aware of the lease structure itself and there are things you can negotiate and then there are things you can't. Like no landlord's going to say, I'm going to do away with the property tax reimbursement. They can't fix their expense for what would be a five-year lease and just lose money if there's no ability to go back to the tenant to recapture it. There are things you can do to protect yourself that you can negotiate into the lease, but understanding just kind of the basics of that. And then just there are other little things too. You know, the certificate of occupancy process can be a pain in the rear. So you can actually, most cities will allow you to pull a CO before you sign a lease. And so if you have any question as to whether or not the space is going to work for you from a zoning perspective, a lot of industrial spaces, there's nuances in lease or in zoning laws that, you know, may prohibit you from doing certain things like welding in the space or buying a large printing equipment or the Plano here locally has a zoning called RT zoning, where each building has to have at least uh, 30% office space in it. So if you were to go in there thinking you could go in and rip some out as a tenant and you go to pull a permit for that, the city's going to say, can't do it. So you can pull a CO before you move into a space and make sure that you understand what the city's going to require. But the other thing that I think people find shocking is how long the transaction takes. And this is what I tell clients all the time. And, and it's way better to start way earlier than you probably think you need to because it just takes forever. And if you pick a spot that needs construction done to it, you just got to add another three to four months of timeline onto your, on your total project timeline. So, you know, for clients that are under 50,000 feet, we're encouraging them to hit the market no later than 12 months before the lease expires, go out and tour, solicit RFPs from landlords, negotiate LOIs, and then just be aware of whatever construction is needed in each building you're going to move to. If you're a bigger tenant than that and you have a bigger construction need, you probably need to start sooner. And there's ways you can negotiate, you know, lease commencement language to make sure that you're protected if the deal, you know, if the lease commences, but the construction is not done. So we're helping tenants with that all the time. But there's a lot to it and can't stress enough working with an expert to help you navigate the process. But I would say those are a couple of things. Make sure you're aware of maintenance obligations in the building, who's paying for what. Another big thing is make sure you understand, even though if the landlord's taking care of it, if what the bill back rights are, because the landlord can sometimes recapture those costs. They can go spend money on your behalf and then send you a bill for it, which is never fun. So triple net lease structures, understand those, understand zoning, whether the space is going to work for you, and then just make sure you're starting early, I think is probably. So it's not like, uh, hey, I need a new apartment. I can go right. look on Monday and move in on Saturday. Yep. Yeah, I joke. There are no look and lease specials in our <laughs> business. There's no like, hey, come look on a Friday and sign that same day and we'll give you the keys that day and then you can move in on Saturday. I think a lot of new business owners, young entrepreneurs, they think that, unfortunately, that's how it works. And 
they get very frustrated when the landlord's like, let me see your financials. Let me see your business plan. Let me see this, that, and the other. The landlord's doing a bunch of due diligence because they don't want you in the space for a long period of time if, if they don't think the space is going to work for you. And then we're still in a landlord's market. So some landlords are evaluating two or three deals at a time for the same space. That's going away a little bit, but that's one thing to be aware of too. You got to put yourself in the best position possible. So as a buyer, you've actually got to be more competitive than other people looking at that same space. Yep. Yep. Interesting. I mean, obviously we hear all the time about people you know, having to overbid for houses. I didn't realize that was the case in commercial real estate as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been a tight purchase market for a while, even though interest rates were very friendly towards owner occupants, there just hasn't been a lot of inventory available because everyone's got the same idea. Everyone coming out of COVID was flush with cash. They had low interest rate availability from the bank. The bank was calling them saying, let me make you a loan. All kinds of banks were wanting to make loans, but there just wasn't enough inventory. And so then you had this pressure down on inventory, which drove sale prices way up and lease rates have gone up too. But yeah, there's there's not a lot of quick transactions. Even a standard sale transaction from when you sign a contract is a 30-day inspection, 30-day close. So there's a lot. And that's if everything is like really smooth. Right. Yeah. That's typically if the buyer has everything in line. They've run their due diligence. The seller has all their stuff in line. The lender is teed up early. Because a lot of times in a commercial transaction, especially with business owners, the lender will, they'll want to look at personal financials. They'll want to look at personal financial statements. They'll want to make sure all your LLC tax returns are filed on time and correctly. And so there's, there's a lot that gets scrutinized in a, you know, especially the bigger the loan, but in the bigger banks just have a lot more due diligence behind them. But that's always something I think is a big surprise to first time building purchasers as well. It's like, oh, I thought I could just call the bank and get a quick loan. And here the bank is 45 days later and you still don't have loan approval. That can be pretty frustrating. All right. We've talked about leasing. We've talked about buying from the business owner perspective, from the, the tenant perspective. Walk us through like what should be going through your mind when you're considering leasing versus owning the space? Yeah. Why would I do one over the other? Yeah, I think assuming you had options available on both sides. So let's say that you had a, a market with a little bit more equilibrium to it where you had available options to lease and a handful of options that you could buy. I think it starts with, I always ask my clients, hey, what's your 10-year plan for the business? And if you think that 3,000 feet or 30,000 feet or 100,000 feet, if that initial square footage is going to last you, if you're able to grow your business in that initial square footage over a 10-year horizon, you're better off purchasing because you can get a 20-year note. And at the end of that 10-year time frame, your building is half paid off. And you're maintaining all the business or all the building systems inside the space anyway. So you don't really have any more increased financial exposure there, but it really comes down to down payment amounts as well. You can do SBA loans below 5 million bucks and put 10% down. So that's a pretty good program for first time building owners that are going to occupy majority of the building. And there's, you know, there's some restrictions to it, but one thing that a prospective client is not going to tell you until they trust you is how much they're looking to pay on a down payment. But I typically tell them, hey, look, on a most loan transactions, you're going to need about 20% of the down payment. And then any construction cost is going to be on top of that. So we kind of start there and then just what's available in the market. So we have clients all the time that are like, I want to buy something or lease something. And we'll go run a search 30 to 50,000 square feet, come back to them. Like, hey, Mr. Jones, you said you wanted 30 to 50,000 feet. There's 20 options available total in the geography you said you wanted to be in. 18 of them are lease options. And here are the two options for sale. And they're kind of junkers, you know. There's a reason they're still on the market. And so if you're looking to buy a building, you really got to be patient, especially in this market. You got to be probably willing to make some off-market offers and maybe even willing to negotiate against yourself, which most people hate doing. But if you make an offer that doesn't get accepted, be ready to probably up the ante if you really want the building and you think it's a good deal. But the biggest question I ask is, what's your 10-year business plan? Are you kind of towards the growth end of your business progress? Are you still in infancy stage? Like it wouldn't have made sense for you to buy a 1,500 square foot office building when you've got big growth plans. 
we've seen it too, where a client will buy a building and they think they're going to be there forever and they land a huge account and all of a sudden they're like, well, man, I need more space or I got to go buy something that's different. And now they got to sell that building and go lease something else. So they're having to time the market a little bit, but that's one big question I start with and then, and then go to what the options are. And then a lot of clients want to build something too, but that's a whole nother can of worms. I've only had a few clients do that in my 20 plus year career because it's just a, it's a much longer process, a lot more involved, and you really got to have some expertise on the construction side to really pull it off. But earlier we talked about things that I've learned along the way and don't try to do this on your own. Mm -hmm. You need that expert. And you, you just touched on another one. And that is that off market. I wouldn't even know where to begin to go and find something that was off market or yeah. how to go about contacting somebody. And in fact, how we came to the place that we are now, it was off market. Right. And you made the calls and open a door that I didn't even know existed. Yeah. You just got to uncover opportunities. I mean, once you have, you know, kind of the desired space that the client is looking for, if you found it, I mean, I, I've asked questions all the time of prospective sellers, like, Hey, would you consider selling? And a lot of times the answer is no. And sometimes they'll say, well, yeah, we consider selling. Then my next question is, well, what are you looking to get for it? And sometimes they throw a number out and you're like, man, let's go to title company right now. That's a phenomenal deal. Or they may throw a number out that's so above market that you're like, all right, well, at least we know where you're at. But it's just asking the question and trying to be creative and trying to figure out, again, making a deal for both parties that's beneficial. Maybe the landlord doesn't want to be a landlord forever. Maybe they want to retire in five years and they want this big payout from this building sale. So they don't want to do a 10-year deal with you. Well, maybe they'd give you a purchase option. And maybe there's all kinds of things that you can do on a creative from a creative standpoint to try to hit everyone's goals. Cause everyone's got every building owner, every business owner, they should have some idea of where they want to be five to 10 years. And a lot of building owners will have to sell at some point to either pay taxes or the next generation inherits the building and they didn't want it. And they're like, I don't want this building. I'd rather have the cash. So, and it's just staying in contact with brokers and having good relationships and be willing to make cold calls as well. And that's how we've uncovered a lot of opportunities on the purchase side for clients, like buildings for lease for two years and just sitting there, maybe they're willing to sell it. But if no one asks them the question, they're not going to, they're probably not going to bring it up. Did you ever see the show American Pickers? Uh, no. Oh man, it's so great. I don't think they're airing new episodes, but these two guys drive around the country in a van and they literally, they go antiquing like in people's houses and yards. Like they'll, they'll knock on a door if they, if they see a bunch of junk out in somebody's yard and you know, if they'll let them in and pick through their junk, they'll offer them stuff. And one of my favorite things that they do when they say, Hey, would you sell this? And they say, eh, no. The question is, what's the, I don't want to sell it price. Yeah. And it reminds me of what you were talking about a minute ago. Yeah. Kind of similar to the, the Zillow make me move. Right. You know? But yeah, one of my old bosses who was a savvy investor, he told me, Hey, he used to say everything, but my wife and kids are for sale. And depending on when you asked him, his kids might be for sale too. <laughs> But if you're a true investor and you see real estate as an investment, then you should be detached enough emotionally to have a number in mind that if someone were to come close to that, you would say, all right, I'm ready to ready to sell it and do something different. So, All right. You mentioned earlier when you're starting the process, interview two, three brokers, you gave some good questions. And if you got other questions, I'd love to hear those as well. But what's the best way for someone to go about finding those two or three people to, to even interview? Yeah. I think, I mean, coming from a veteran cold caller, I think your best bet is somebody who's been knocking on your door for a long time that truly wants your business. You know, if you got to go chase down two to three brokers and they don't want to do your deal and you're chasing them, it's probably not a good fit for that broker. And you want to work with a broker who's going to take your transaction seriously, number one, and, and someone that it means something to you. And you know, here in DFW, there's no shortage of brokers. I mean, there are thousands, thousands of commercial real estate brokers. Dallas-Fort Worth is like the Hollywood for commercial real estate. Yeah. I mean, the the industry wasn't invented here, but it sure feels like it was. It feels like- Like Chick-fil-A. We didn't Chick invent the chicken, but we right. didn't invent the chicken sandwich. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And a lot of that comes from Trammell Crow, who pioneered so much of the way that we still do business today on the third-party brokerage side. But if you're a business owner and someone's been cold calling on you and they've been persistent and they've been bringing value to you every time you talk to them, I would give them first crack. 
and you probably, if you have been in your space for a while, you've probably got two or three of those business cards sitting on your desk, uh, at least here in Dallas, Fort Worth. But if you don't have anybody that's cold calling on you, I'd probably talk to maybe your neighbors, like, hey, who did you, have you guys done a commercial transaction recently? Did you work with somebody you liked? Would you recommend that person? A referral is is huge as well. Word of mouth, as we know, is the best advertising out there. And if my next door neighbor would say, man, we just sold our house and we loved our agent, maybe I, even if I don't need to sell today, I might stick that card in a file. So if you don't have people calling on you, I'd probably talk to some of your neighbors that may have just moved in recently and who they work with. And I'd probably stay away from Google, just Googling brokers and loop net leads and that sort of thing. Cause you can buy those ads as a broker for pretty cheap and you can buy search engine optimization, uh, catchphrases that make you look like more of an expert than you are, but finding somebody. And that's how I've always tried to find the experts that I work with, like real estate attorneys. I've asked clients like, Hey, who'd you use in the last deal? Or do you have a real estate? I've asked other brokers, do you have real estate attorneys you like or title companies you like? I mean, try to find somebody who's done a transaction in your market. And I would start with at least two or three of those and then interview them and, and find out who's the best fit. Let's talk for a minute about trends and what's going on. You touched on something. You said that it's cooling a little bit yeah. for the landlord side, but for a while, much like the residential side where it's been a seller's market, sounds like it's a landlord's market right now. Yep. What are some other things that you are seeing in this space? You know, COVID was a crazy accelerator for industrial. And the main reason for that is when you take millions and billions of people in the world and you lock them in their houses for at least 30 days, everyone goes to the internet and they start purchasing stuff on the internet they normally would drive to the store for. So that creates an immediate demand for industrial product. So a lot of industrial suppliers, they ramped up their inventory huge over the last four years. And they need a place to put it. And they needed a place to put it. Yeah. And so DFW for the last four years has led the nation in total industrial construction, net new construction every year. So anywhere from 40 to 60 million square feet of product. But the challenge has been for tenants, and I hear this all the time, is they drive around, they're like, what do you mean there's nothing available? I'm driving around, I see buildings going up everywhere. I'm like, well, it's true, but a lot of these buildings that are being built are million square foot, two million foot. Unless you're willing to take a 300,000 foot section of that building, they're just not going to cut it up any smaller than that. So then you start looking at vacancy rates. Right now, the Metroplex is around 7%, but we've had five consecutive quarters of interest rate or not interest rate, vacancy rate increases, which is direct correlation to lease rates. And if vacancy rates continue to go up, then you'll see lease rates come down. But it's a lease rates are a, a lagging indicator of vacancy rates. And it doesn't happen overnight. In fact, I've had clients call me too. As soon as the interest rates are raised 25 basis points, they call and they say, hey, can I get a good deal on my lease now? I'm like, well, it doesn't really work like that. There's like a 12 to 18 month lag time between vacancy rates going up and the landlords really starting to feel the pinch on their vacancy before they cut you a better deal. But if they've got long-term debt on the building and they locked in low, then there yep. really is no leverage for the tenant side. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you never know is you never know what the landlord's true position is. Sometimes they'll tell you, sometimes they'll say, hey, we, we're about to refinance this debt and we got to get this deal done. And it would look a lot better on our balance sheet if we had this vacancy off the books. And so, you know, at that point, they're still not going to let you take advantage of them because they're savvy enough to know, like, I'm just not going to do that deal if you make me a terrible offer. But at least you know enough to go to that landlord and say, hey, maybe if you give us another month or two of free rent, we can get a deal done and they'll probably do it. But we're not we're not really seeing that yet, which is crazy. And I don't think we will. I think we've kind of bottomed out on where the market is. And as much as I hate to applaud the federal government, I think they did the right thing by raising interest rates when they did. And, and they did it pretty quick. And I think they were forthcoming about when they were going to do that. And so I've had investors tell me too, like, I don't really care what the playbook is or what the rules are. I just can't have them changing constantly. I can't have interest rates going up and down all the time. I've got to have some steady playbook to run with. And so I think a lot of investors, they knew, thankfully, that those interest rate increases were coming because it it felt like the roaring 20s for a while where you're like, man, we are going so crazy up that <laughs> I hope there's not a major crash on the other side. But 
I think we've balanced out a little bit. Interest rates did cause developers to pull back on development. It's harder to get capital, harder to get debt and equity. Those deal terms that you could get two years ago are, are gone. And so that, that makes it a little bit more difficult. So developers pull back on construction, tenant demand. If it doesn't go up, then vacancy goes down as well. And so you just have this direct correlation between what landlords are building and what tenants are leasing. And so landlords are always looking at what's tenant demand, what's net absorption. Absorption is simply how much space was leased in a market. Positive absorption is more space being leased than more tenants moving into space than more tenants moving out. So anytime there's positive absorption, landlords are looking at that as a good thing. Rates are going up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as we kind of come down the home stretch here, is there anything else that you would want to educate the business owner community on this topic? Yeah, I think we covered most of it. I would say probably ask more questions of your prospective real estate broker than you do. Some of the questions I would ask for our business owners, tell me about Tell me about the last three to five deals you did in this geography and also this product type that I'm looking to lease or to buy in. Tell me about how you handled that transaction for the client. What are some of the challenges that came up that you were able to navigate? One of the things that that I've been fortunate to do on my own is to buy buildings on my own, which has been a big motivation for me to get in the business. My father-in-law and actually your dad was a huge motivation factor for that, owning rental houses and college station and but that motivated me to own commercial product. And so I'm able to tell clients that too. Hey, I've, I've been in that driver's seat as not only an advisor, but also a client. I've done it myself. And so I can advise you. And so I think that's a good question too. I mean, it, if you're looking to buy a building with a broker at the helm, like what are some sale transactions you've worked on? How did that go? And you know, tell me about what you think. I mean, the question we answer almost all day, every day is what's going on in the market. That's a pretty simple one. Someone starts throwing out stuff that's just headline Wall Street Journal, but they don't know what's going on in your own backyard. That's a pretty telltale sign because if your broker's working with the same info that everyone else is, they're probably not going to get you as good of a deal as as they can if they have some on the streets knowledge about a particular product type. I listened to a podcast recently where Barry Sternlicht, the CEO of Starwood Capital, you know, multi-billion dollar asset under management. And he said when he interviews brokers, that's what he asks. Like, hey, how come that space on the corner has been vacant for so long? (laughs) Just unbelievably simple stuff that most business owners aren't really asking the question about. So one real quick point of clarification, your father-in-law and my dad are not the same person. Correct. So yes, switching gears, being a real estate broker is a lot like being a business owner and our audiences, owners and founders, you're kind of an entrepreneur. That was a term I was introduced to recently. And now I want to use it every chance yeah, I get. So like this it. is perfect. You're an entrepreneur, right? You, yep. you are very entrepreneurial, but you're able to build your business within the infrastructure of this, you know, this larger firm. I mean, for somebody that may not be thinking of starting a business like mine, but wants to go into real estate, what advice would you give them for how to build a successful commercial real estate practice? Yeah. Again, the experience is going to be key. I would not, you know, I wouldn't stop. If you are a software company owner, I wouldn't sell your company and immediately go into third-party brokerage. I would, if you're interested in owning a brokerage firm, is that kind of what you're... No, I'm thinking more for maybe that young guy coming out of college or somebody that's maybe okay. earlier in the career that's thinking about changing careers and getting into that space as a broker. As a broker. Yeah. And that's fortunately what I'm doing a lot now is interviewing to grow the team. And so really what I'm looking for is somebody who's, you know, they don't have to have sales experience, but that's a pretty good indicator. You know, in an interview, you hear a lot of, I mean, you, you've done way more interviews than I have, but you hear a lot of, yeah, I'm willing to do that, but it's a lot more compelling when someone's like, no, 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 here's what I've done. And so what I've said is if somebody has sales experience, whether it's selling software or cars, you know, they're successful real estate brokers that were in the the car business before. But if you can sell a product or a service, then I can help you learn what the nuances are between what we're selling. You know, we're service providers at the end of the day. So, I mean, sales experience is, is great. If you're looking to get into the business and you're in college and as an intern, you can make some calls 
you got to be a little careful because if you don't have your license, you can't be really soliciting the firm's solution to anybody. But you can make calls and gather information. And if you like cold calling, you're a rare breed. But it's something you just don't really know if you like it until you do it. And I think a lot of people are like, no, I can do it, but I don't really want to do it. I think it's a necessary evil. You hear that a lot. But the most successful brokers in our industry are ones that are just day in, day out, disciplined prospectors. And they're either really good at networking or they're really good at cold calling or they're good at social media has been something that a few brokers have picked up on the last five years on LinkedIn. We're historically dinosaurs in the technology space. But, and I think if you don't have that on your resume, but you can get some sort of sales experience doing something, you know, selling books door to door, or maybe some of you helped a business owner, like go find 500 new business cards to put into their mailing list. And you did that by knocking on doors. I mean, you can start small somewhere that can help you get that experience that shows a prospective broker that's looking to hire you that you're willing to actually do the work. So. That's what I'm, I'm looking for that over more so than GPA or even college major. I mean, those are things that are most important to me is are, are you really willing to pick up the phone and try to find who the decision maker is and confident enough to tell them like, no, I think I'm the best guy for the job or the best girl for the job. And then can you communicate why you think that is with conviction? Because I think there's no shortage of people in our industry that'll say they're the, they're the market expert, but what does that really mean? Are you able to really kind of unpack that for for the client in a way that they understand it. One more kind of thought on this, or maybe a quick story. I'll tee it up and you fill in the, the gap. I remember you telling me that somebody that you called on early as you were looking to get your first commercial real estate job, they told you, hey, I'm not interested. Why don't you go back to school and get a, finish the story. You remember this one? Oh, this is a hiring. Yeah, yeah this is yeah, hiring. Yeah, yeah, this is a funny story. Yeah, so I had graduated. I was actually getting my real estate license. So I was like gung-ho. I was getting into real estate and I was probably would have taken a bad job if I had to get in because I wanted to do it. But I I had met with a family friend, a connection of a family friend and had driven up here to Dallas. And he looks at my resume, doesn't ask me any questions, sees that I wasn't a business major. I was a religion major, kind of slides the resume back over to me and says, hey man, if I were your dad, I would tell you to go to community college and probably take some accounting classes. <laughs> I was like, well, what do you, what accounting? I don't understand. He was like, well, you need to, you need to know how to read a profit and loss statement and need to know how to read a balance sheet if you're going to advise clients on real estate matters. And I was like, man, I, that was a punch to the gut. I mean, I, the last thing I wanted to do was go back to school and, and sit in community college and learn accounting. I was like, man, I'll, I'll read whatever book you put in front of me. I'll even read accounting for dummies. I mean, what have you got, you know? <laughs> But needless to say, that that opportunity didn't work out. But when I got hired by my first boss, I went back to all the people that I'd met with and just said, hey, thank you. Here's where I landed. I sent that guy a thank you email. Appreciate you meeting with me. And he said, hey, the guy that you landed with is one of the best in the business and you're going to be more successful than you thought possible if you do it his way. And so it, it worked out. But <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I think there's some lessons just in that story. And Ultimately, to be successful in this business, it's about the tenacity. It's mm -hmm. about the willingness to make that next call and knock on that next door. Yep. And you can learn the other things. But if you don't have that that tenacity, you're not going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was talking about selling book lessons again. One of the things they used to say that would drive me crazy was they would say the answer to all your problems lies behind the next door. Like, don't stop. Cold calling essentially is what they're saying. Like it starts raining and you need an umbrella. Guess where the umbrella is? It's behind the next door. Knock on the door and the person sees you're standing in the pouring rain. They may not buy a book from you, but they hand you an umbrella. Well, now you got an umbrella to walk the rest of your route with, you know? And so I think that's huge too. Just don't let the kind of minor circumstances pull you away from your big goals. And I think if you want to get into the real estate business, you got to have some big goals too, which I've been fortunate to hit personally. But if you're looking at it just as a day in, day out job, I don't think you're going to be successful. But I think if you say, here's where I want to be in five years, here's where I want to be in 10 years, and you're working towards that bigger goal, when you get punches in the gut, you know, on the weekend, week out, when you have a bad quarter, bad half a year, when you go a couple of months without making a deal and your, your income falls a little bit, but you have your eye on that bigger goal, you're like, all right, this is just a 
a one inning and a nine inning ball game, then I think you're going to do well. Good advice. Yeah, well, man. Adam, thank you for coming and sharing. Appreciate you being on a guest on In the Thick of It. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. That was Adam Curran, Managing Principal at Holt Lunsford Commercial. To learn more, visit holtlunsford.com. If you or a founder you know would like to be a guest on In the Thick of It, email us at intro at founderstory.us. 